So we're all here today because of uh, a Republican president and, and, and his attitude to science. And that Republican president is Abraham Lincoln. And, and Lincoln was the architect of the land-grant institutes. And we heard Neil talking about what those land grants represent. So in 1862, the America, America embarked on this phenomenal experiment in higher education. Um, and Lincoln signed into law both the land-grant university systems, and there was about 69 of them at the time, as well as the USDA. And to follow that up the next year, he, he inaugurated the National Academy of Sciences. And this was all in the, in the height of the Civil War. So you can imagine the, the ability to marshal Congress to do this. And so Lincoln, Lincoln did this, and the American nation did this, because it was recognized that we needed to have applied science. And so this followed on from a number of issues at the state level. So in 1855, Pennsylvania had a farmer's field school. And then in 1859, we heard about Even Pew. And this is the first Old Main. In this case, they were trying to do a better job of marshalling the resources that they had at hand and recognizing the need to protect those resources for an ever-increasing population. And just as Richard has said, the only way you're going to do something for an ever-increasing population on a planet with finite resources is if you leverage science. And the American economy and the American nation has done a phenomenal job of leveraging science. So this is agriculture today in the United States, the most food secure nation the world has ever seen. Highly mechanized, highly industrialized, and highly efficient. So we're able to have situations like this, instead of having to hoe corn all year, you have a, in a system where lots of individuals do that for us. So hands up here, who's a farmer? So less than 1% of the American population today consider themselves to be a farmer for a living. So Carol Lee, of course, is the head of the department, but she also grows crops. But individuals who do that for a living is a very small percentage of our population. And we can afford to have such a small percentage of individuals farming for us because they do it so efficiently. But despite the great advances we've seen in uh, farming in America, it is not what's represented in the situation globally. So this lady on the, on, on the foot of Mount Kenya, she represents what farming is on a global scale. So over 80% of all farms in the world are less than two hectares. That's about three or four times the size of, of the football pitch that people will be playing on today. It's a very small plot of land. It's 85% of those are family farms as well. And those individuals are eking out an existence. So how can we take individuals like this who represent a large proportion of humanity and give them the benefits that we find in an American agricultural system. So, so Neil has talked about our strategic plan and, and, and front and center of our strategic plan is this idea that we are going to be a 21st century land grant university. And it's difficult to articulate what that will be, but I came to Penn State to study zombie ants and work in rainforests. And over the last five or six years, I've really transitioned to thinking about agriculture because of the, the great history of this university, its great accomplishments in the past around food security, and most importantly, its potential for the future. So I think about this uh, um, Lincoln quote, um, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. The occasion is piled high with difficulties and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, we must think anew, we must act anew, we must disenthrall ourselves. And what Lincoln was saying in 1862 in his letter to Congress was that what we had in the past will not prepare us for the future. The last 50 years of great advancements in American agriculture will not even prepare us for the future of agriculture in this country. And it certainly doesn't prepare us for the future of agriculture globally. We really have to disenthrall ourselves because global climate change, as Richard already pointed out, has having manifest effects on the Syrian civil war, for example. There's currently a drought in the Horn of Africa. There's a famine in South Sudan. There's also, of course, the situation locally. We see this in California with the, the drought they've had over multiple years. So that what we've done in the past have, ha, has led us to a situ situation where we may be complacent, and what we absolutely need to do is disenthrall ourselves. This is the stormy present. Uh, in my lifetime, the population has doubled. As my kids grow up to be my age, they can expect a world of over 9 billion people. We may plateau in 2100 at over 11 billion. 
These individuals will want to eat food just like Americans. 5% of the world's population are Americans, and they consume 25% of the resources. What happens when China wants to have the food you have every day, and why wouldn't they? The UN FAO estimates that we need to have four more planets to feed that population. And there's no way we have four more planets. So what we're going to have to do, exactly as Richard said, is leverage science. So that's the stormy present. This is the situation in US agriculture. We see a great increase over time, great efficiencies in the system, and this is African agriculture here. It hasn't changed, the needle hasn't moved. And they have many, many challenges. Infectious diseases of the crops, fungal diseases, pathogens in the soil, low nutrients or relatively poor soil, and also pests and weeds. And I would say a lot of that falls into knowledge. This idea that if you had an extension system that works so wonderfully well in the United States, if you had an extension system on a global level, then you could do a really, really good job. Penn State has been thinking about this over the last four or five years, so they've invested heavily in something called Plant Village. This is a way to use that phone that's in your pocket, the one that's already been uh, uh, shown around. That phone is a supercomputer which has the computing power a million times more than the power of sending man to the moon with the Apollo space missions. It has a phenomenal uh, camera inside it. It has sensors we can leverage. So one of the ideas of Plant Village is to leverage the power of phones and the technology that allows you to get an Uber or, or a latte at Starbucks, leverage that technology to enable farmers around the world to do a better job. So Plant Village gives a lot of information for free. In the four years it's been going, it's had over four million users and it's growing at 250% per year. So just if we do nothing else, we can just see the, the effect that this will have. Individuals around the world get an extension system comparable to what we have here in central Pennsylvania. But we really want to go on because Penn State is a unique interdisciplinary research environment. There's a happy valley here. It's a happy valley that functions extremely well for our students. They're, they're gloriously happy. Very much the same for the alumni. But I would say that a happy valley also permeates the ways in which researchers on this campus interact with one another. The graduate students work very effectively well, the professors work very effectively well with each other. And not only do they collaborate well, but this is the increasingly important distinction to my mind, they do so across disciplines. So the work that we're doing is, is involving a mobile device, as you can see up there, this is able to look inside the leaf and tell you whether it's infected or not. We're, we're working on this in both Tanzania and Nigeria today, looking at cassava diseases. We're using phones and machine recognition and agriculture and our Rock Springs Agricultural Research Stations and the Department of Plant Pathology and expertise in agriculture. And we're, we're figuring out what diseases are there and how might we automate the, the diagnosis of diseases. We're using drones. Uh, we're mapping our Rock Springs um, agricultural research stations. We're going to start doing that every day for the next four or five months. We're also doing this in Tanzania, where we're mapping farms of cassava. We're currently working with a large project in Kenya with 28,000 farms, a, a European Union-funded project. We're going to map them all with, with, with uh, hyperspectral imaging on drones. This is some... some um, Satellite imagery, which gives you um, a normalized differential vegetation index. Essentially, the satellite is looking from space in infrared, and this can tell you how much the, the plant is growing and the productivity over a season. Penn State just got recognized recently by um, a private company called Planet, which have 180 satellites in orbit. They have given us unrestricted access to their satellites across all of East Africa, as well as our Rock Springs field station. So we have uh, probably an experimental research unit, which is very effectively leveraging the power of uh, satellites. And these are just three meter resolution imagery. Um, there's people in geosciences who have a backpack drill that you can go around and drill down to find the water table. And then we use uh, soil science to understand this, as well as social science, because you have to work within these communities. So when I say Happy Valley Science, what I really mean is electrical engineering, computer science, agriculture, mechanical engineering, earth science, geoscience, soil, and social sciences working very, very effectively together. Just in the same way you enjoy tailgating or students enjoy partying, the faculty here really enjoy playing well together um, in a sandbox, and we do this really well. And this is the, 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 the reason I think that over the next 20 years, 
What we are currently seeing is a disenfranchisement among public around the world with governments, with corporations. It's the public university system which holds this unique position to be an agent of important change, change which depends upon science, which, it, which, is, which is value added and gives a great deal to our communities. And we don't know what the future is going to be, but I think Penn State can play an enormously important role in global food security, as well as dealing with issues of climate change, or as Ileana is going to talk about with our coral reefs. It's a very, very special place, and we should really leverage that capability. Thank you.